Welcome to the Adam Savage Project. I'm Adam. I'm Norm. And Amber Ruffin is here to join us. Amber. Hi. Hello. We're doing it. We are finally doing it. Uh, welcome to the podcast. You are in New York and it is only 5 p.m., but it's super dark over there. It's so dark already. You know, watching the video, you can see out your window and it looks like a fake New York backdrop because, <laughs> right, like of a, of, of, a, of a set. But no, that's <laughs> evening in New York and you're on, you know, you're high up on a skyscraper. It's yeah, I appreciate real. There's the, people in these little boxes. I appreciate the, the little sliver of blue between the buildings. It's a nice art direction touch. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. God did it. I will also point out that you two are both using ring lights, and I'm the only one without a ring light today. Norm also has one. 2020. Norm, you and I are doing the right thing. Adam's wrong. <laughs> also, my assistant brought this thing in here. <laughs> I, I, I'm not good at things. I did a gig for somebody, and they sent me the ring light for free as part of the gig. They also were. You get to keep it? I did, yeah. Oh, that's nice. I know. And they also sent me a pair of AirPods, which are going to be a Christmas present, I think, for my niece. <laughs> Everybody be quiet and don't tell my niece I'm giving her AirPods. <laughs> okay, I won't. So it's like a mobile production that, kit. No. You said that you're you're in there at 30 Rock alone, that no one else is coming in. Can you walk us through? You have, And you are currently working on at least two shows. You're working on Seth Meyers' show and your own show. Yeah. Tell us what your week is like. Uh, thank you for asking. It's full <laughs> of glitz and glamour. So I guess I get in on Monday and then do a butt ton of work. There's freaking 50 11 meetings. Everyone has written something and I have to read it. Also, I have to pitch at late night Seth. So Mondays are murder. Tuesdays. You start getting a little bit ahead and you can kind of breathe. You have to like uh, go over all the songs for the Amber Ruffin show. But then you also have to, if you have something in the show, like today I was in Amber Says What in the show. So then that's like 40% of your day is like hair and makeup and rehearsal and clothes and blah, blee, blue, blee, doing it. So then there's that. But if you're free on Tuesday, then you just work like a dog. So Monday and Tuesday, you have to work like a dog and there's no way around it. Then Wednesday, time really starts to free up. That's when you write the good stuff. So then there's a <laughs> couple meetings on Wednesday, but nothing crazy. Thursday, you spend the whole day looking around going, did I forget to do something? I don't understand why I have all this free time. Then Friday, you shoot the show. Wow. Yeah. I'm I'm curious. I've been curious since the beginning of COVID because we met a couple of years ago at New York Comic Con, and I'm I'm fascinated by writers' rooms. It I've I've visited a couple. Um, I'm curious how COVID affected the process of working with other writers. I know there's a, a tradition of like writers taking stuff away and writing it and coming back, but how does the feedback loop work in the writers' room in COVID? Well, the way I write has always been this. I sit down, I write out a whole thing. I send it to Jenny Hagel, um, my head writer on the Amber Ruffin show and my co-writer on Lady Never Said Myers. And she rewrites it and she sends it back. And then I give it one more once over and then I turn it in. And that's true for almost everything I've ever written. Wow. I send it to her or Lutz and they rewrite it and they send it back. But every once in a while, something crazy happens at like 10 in the morning. And then you're like, oh, well, shit, we only have one hour until the meeting. Can we spit something out in an hour? So then Jenny sh scoots her chair in. That's a lie. She types faster. I scoot my chair to Jenny. And then we type and we pass the keyboard back and forth until we're done. And then we go one more time over it. And then we send it in. And then sometimes we end up doing it that day. Oh my gosh. And that's the fun part. Is that really fun? Is that like, it feels yes. kind of, yeah. I'll yeah, bet. it feels like you're playing business. And then you have to go to 50 people and be like, I need, you know, a, <laughs> um, a choir robe. 
<laughs> someone else go, I need matronly makeup. You go to someone else and you go, I need 80s video music lighting. It's crazy. When you run around with a clipboard all day talking about business, business. It's cute. <laughs> um, I noticed uh, at the beginning of COVID or there was somewhere, there was a shift in the in Seth's show at a certain point where it was clear that y'all stopped giving any fucks whatsoever. And you just started like laying out reality for what reality was. Was that a was that a discussion or was that just sort of where all of your guys' writing was was moving towards? Yeah. It was just how we reacted to the world falling yeah. apart. Yeah. So yeah, I don't think it was a concerted effort. We just happened to feel the same way about everything. What a freaking mess. But you know, you look back and you're like, things were pretty bad for a while. Because remember when, um, what is it? Justice Kavanaugh had the um, uh, his hearing. Yeah. I, I remember watching that at work being like, oh, this is bad. And he's definitely still going to get this job. <laughs> 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 like, this is truly horrible. And that I do think that's the beginning of when it, I, everyone realized th things are going to get very badly, very quickly. But, mm. you know, no one like predicted Corona, but it was like, it is a perfect um, slant up. There are no jumps and shit. Everything just got slightly worse daily for forever. This is my strongest argument that we live in a situ in a simulation <laughs> because because the writing is so poor. <laughs> the writing for reality is really a little too obvious and a little too on the nose. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty yeah. terrible. I don't know who's in charge of it, but they have some work to do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I look to the people I follow on Twitter and and you know the social medias and it feels like comedy and comedians and people who write in for late night shows and perform, they're the people who maybe it's the permission structure there, but like they speak the most truth and they like the things they, you guys say resonate the most. And I don't know, what is it about comedy, that balance of comedy and then being honest that just, that's, it, it's what works. Yeah. Well, lots of times you can't have one without the other you know, especially if you're doing like social commentary, you have to include like how you feel. Now, I don't think anyone foresaw that y you could lay your feelings so bare like that, like we've been doing. I would never have thought that that would fly, but it does. Cause everyone's like, I want to cry. But then people oh, fucking funny. got on TV and cried. And I was like, oh, we're doing this. We're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel, did you see the scientific study recently that, that proved beyond a doubt that, um, that, uh, that authoritarian voters are not funny? <laughs> <laughs> the proof beyond a doubt itself is funny. <laughs> well, this is the best part is the experimental methodology is really, really neat. They had a bunch of setups and they asked this large group of people of all sorts of political disciplines to finish the setup. And then they had the various answers judged by a wide array of people uh, with no with no skin in the game. They had no idea whose jo jokes they were judging. And b for the for the largest degree, authoritarian voters could not finish a joke. That's fantastic. I That's know. exactly what I want. <laughs> <laughs> also, those that poor. Um, person who came up with this had to read all those awful jokes. Right, right. <laughs> they had to read all of these like all cruel responses to joke setups, right? I love it. Um, I wish I'd been part of that so bad. <laughs> uh, one of the weird graces of COVID is that our our little corner of the web, Tested.com, turns out to be COVID proof. Like my whole team is still working, and we're doing we're having a we're having actually a real creative wonderful time in this bizarro shit stain of a universe um 
And it sounds like you guys are also ha- like the camaraderie, both on Seth's team, and I'm actually going to ask about starting a show in COVID, but that also seems like you guys are really, uh, 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 like it's a real, like it feels like a family in from the outside when I hear, when I, when I watch the show. Yes, we are all in love. It is very terrible. <laughs> and I think that when the outside world is hot garbage, you're eager to come to work and it is nice to be here. And even though you're kind of talking about the same things, it's still, it it feels good to not be cooped up in the house because you were cooped up in the house for forever. It feels nice to get out of the house. It feels nice to talk to people you're not married to. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I, I must say, extra marital suitors. <laughs> I, I I must say, I also appreciate uh, watching you guys and watching other uh, the other uh, uh, talk shows, watching the same bits of media with similar jokes. I, I'm I de- I'm sure you guys don't call each other ahead of time, but you call each other afterwards and be like, "You did a you did a better version of my joke, or I did a better version of your joke." Um. No. Well, I would. <laughs> if I saw that, I definitely would. Because we're certainly all little pals. Yeah, of course. Everybody's on someone's text chain. Like, we're all connected. And everyone's always talking about how work is. But um, but our show is the best. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally mean, agree. Ha, ha, ha. But we are the, ha- we're the happiest staff. Uh, far and away the happiest staff in late night. Except for my agree. staff. <laughs> I forgot. Okay, so it goes my staff, then Seth and his people, then everybody else. So it's not like um, what was that? Sh- what was the movie? The the wonderful movie with Mindy Kaling and 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 late and, night. Uh, what's that? Late night. It's called late, late night. night. Yeah, I love that movie. We I think we've already watched it three times since this came out. It's yeah. not. It's not like that though. You're not like walking around like trashing everybody's <laughs> ego. No, but I hear, well, okay, so you know what I just realized today? Like, you know, I don't like to be mean, and I don't think that it is cute or funny to be mean to people. And I realized maybe I was mean to someone in a very hilarious bit. So one of the... One of the cue card guys got hired as a writer because sometimes when you work cue cards, you can submit to mono. And he just kept getting jokes on and on and on. And they were like, we have to hire this guy. So they hired him and he's the fucking best. So everyone loves him. We hired him. He's the best, but that's not enough. You know, you get a new job and you feel scared. So I used to sing his name. His name is Ian. He still works here, of course, because he's my, and um, I, once accidentally called him Ian Shroud because I know a guy named Ian Shroud, but that's not his name. His name is Ian Morgan. Okay, so mm-hmm. I would I would always sing the song. It would be like, too bad Ian's getting fired. And I, I would go, so everybody light a candle for the writer who was. It's Ian whatever his last name was. <laughs> light a candle for the writer who was. He got fired and then he died. <laughs> it's not nice. That's not a nice thing to sing to a person. So I did do that, but I think he thought it was funny. But I was thinking about that earlier today, going, "Wait, was I bullying someone?" It's possible. Counterpoint: You were thinking about his. You're at least talking about him. That's a counterpoint. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's true. He's in the conversation. He's in yeah. the mix. <laughs> and you're taking up time to sing a song, make up a song about him. That right there is a big compliment. Yeah, it must be love. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it bittersweet to get your own show in the middle of this uh, this timeline? For sure. Yeah. Um, because it, I just thought, Oh, you know, all my friends are going to come visit and we're all going to hang out and then we're all going to throw a party and then all the writers are going to move from L.A. to here. But they're still in L.A. And we're like, stay there. We do not need you here. So, like, it's the segmented thing. Also, I wrote a book with my sister called 
you'll never believe what happens to Lacey. It comes out on January 12th. Congratulations. And I guess you can order that at places where there are books when you go online. I don't know. I don't know. We'll um, include I, a link in the comments. Okay, good. Because someone should have talked to me about it. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, we just finished it. Now it comes out soon. You pre-order it and stuff. But this whole time I was thinking, oh, and then Lacey will come here in December, my sister, and then we'll go on our press tour. I'm not going to a press tour. I don't get to go fly around America with my sister talking about racist stories that have happened her that make me laugh so hard. We, we don't get to do any of that. And that oh, makes me very sad. Yeah. But it's good that we still get to do this because they could have been like, you can't have a show. It's COVID. Stay at home. No one wants to see you. That could have happened. Heck, it's still good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, I don't want to rub it in, but I will say uh, I did. I, I wrote a book a couple of years ago and it was released in 2019 and I was in production on a show and I, Finished a four and a half month production cycle and immediately left for the book tour, which was a terrible idea. And it almost wrecked me. However, when you do public appearances and you do interviews, doing interviews about a book you've written are the most fun interviews you could imagine. Because you get to read stuff that you've written, which takes up plenty of time. You don't have to worry about filling time. And then you just get to answer questions about the stuff you wrote the book about. It's the best. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, what are so your? You get to go. It was a beautiful. It was great. It was really great. I went and uh, I sold out a movie theater in Austin. Oh um, man! One of the Karamazov brothers, a, a, a hero juggler uh, that I. Yeah, the revered. brothers Karamazov. <laughs> one of them came to my show in Portland and left one of the Karamazov brother hats for me as a gift. Like oh, I had God. so many kind of transformative experiences on that tour. I'm sorry. I'm rubbing it in now. I wanted to know, though. I need to know <laughs> what I'm missing. And it turns out everything. Oh, it's great. It's nice to do the appearances in small spaces and reading to people. I, I, I did a reading at the uh, Barnes & Noble on Union Square. I got to come to New York and see my favorite people there. Um, I've been there. <laughs> do you have... Um, do you have a safe space on television or a podcast or what is the media that you are taking in that's giving you like succor in this time? Nothing. Nothing. You're just nothing. I don't have there is nothing good. There is, <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing that does not work. I'm not ingesting anything that is not comedy. The end. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like I'm writing like a dirty dog and then watching the regular news shows that I write and the comedy shows that I like and that is it and whenever there's a new comedy show I'll watch it and hope that I'll fall in love but like your feelings are too crazy and especially now with a, having a show my feelings are all over the place. So I'm like, how can I just uh, calmly exist? <laughs> you know, you can't really watch like murder, stab them uptown, which no. I used to be able to yeah. enjoy. But now I'm like, I, I got to watch some Care Bears. Um, I'm, I'm currently moving my way through the, uh, the third watching of all 10 episodes of Ted Lasso. It's so good. It's such a good show. I um I have this I have uh, last night we watched I think three in a row uh, for the third time and I'm thinking I really want to I really want to talk to these folks folks about their goal to make what feels like the sweetest show I've ever seen where yeah. everyone's a good person except for Rupert. Yeah, it's the freaking best show. I um they're um my little friends Jason Sudeikis and Brendan Hunt. Brendan Hunt is the quiet. Co oh, yeah, no, I, I read up on him. He um, is, uh, the three of us, not at the same time, maybe those two, did a theater called Boom Chicago in Amsterdam. They're right. my little buds. Oh, you, were doing, you did that as well? Yes, I'm a boom. I'm a boom lady. Brendan Hunt, years ago, have you ever heard of the, um, the documentary King of Kong? 
Oh, yes. Yeah. Orders. Yeah. Love yeah. it. I wrote a musical <laughs> with my girlfriend, Lauren, uh, uh, the King King of Kong, the musical. And I was um, Billy, Billy Mitchell. Mitchell. You were Billy Mitchell. Yes. With the hot sauce and, and the ties. Like, but and Brendan Hunt, the, the quiet yes sure. guy in Ted Lasso, directed it. <laughs> wow. It was the best. And we entered it everywhere. And it won shit. And it was the most fun. It was oh, the most God. fun. Yeah. And then one for one stint, I couldn't make it. So Brendan had to be Billy Mitchell. And it was the best. Yeah. <laughs> um, I uh, I find the, uh, uh, the amount of secret exposition that exists between Brendan and Jason as they're acting off of each other the amount of past history they're able to weave for us yeah but here's my question is what is a Chicago based improv group like in Amsterdam um are there are there American jokes that nobody gets uh, and you learn how to kind of bridge this European uh, American gap sure I mean well what happened was some Chicago improvisers went on vacation in Amsterdam and then they loved it and then they stayed then they got a theater and then started and then it got bigger and stuff but they by the time I got there I got there in 2003 which was Brendan's last year there Mm -hmm. so last like day we overlapped for like oh wow (laughs) and uh then so at that point they'd been doing it for forever yeah. T- 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 10 years so it was it they know what you're gonna get right like when you get there at first you go oh like the um uh kardashians am i right and it's just silence you, know? <laughs> and it's, you have to know what references hit so yeah. then what happens is you just don't reference anything right and it's only just like I'm a cowboy, so I want to shoot things. So, oops, I tried to ride your dog because I thought it was a horse. It's just stuff like that, like character logic instead of, like, words, uh, uh, wordplay of any kind. Although, they can handle wordplay. Dutch people are a great (laughs) audience. They're a great (laughs) audience. They love silly wordplay. They love farting and falling down. And they love American stuff. They can really do it all. I submit that the fart is the very first joke. (laughs) <laughs> that the first joke must be a fart joke. Yeah. Um, Welcome to Boom Chicago. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then they go, yeah, we love it. I remember being surprised. Uh, I built a few science shows that I've toured around the country and into other countries. And I remember learning the hard way that, you know, in America, wherever you are, you can say, hey, howdy, Cleveland, and everyone goes nuts. You say the name of the place you're in, and the audience gives you a big response. Not most other places ever. No, they do not care. Yeah. They do not care that oh. you said Schreifenenge. They don't care. <laughs> they barely care that you're there. You have to work for your applause. I, and that is true, because Americans are like, I'm out of the house. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but French people are like, this is my third day off this week. Entertain me. Oh, <laughs> do you, do you, I remember hearing the story of Eddie Izzard working on a really great impression of Sean Connery speaking French, only to get to France and realize that no one in France has ever heard Sean Connery uh, speak. So oh, they don't yeah, get the joke. dubbed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I also learned weirdly that, and I wouldn't, I still don't understand this. New Zealand audiences are way louder than Australian audiences. I've heard this. Which I, like Australians are much more in your face on on the street than New Zealanders are. But in the auditorium, the the Australians like are like watching television. They're like, oh yeah, you said a joke. Mm." Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks. <laughs> no, thanks, Australians. I love you dearly. You, where you live is beautiful. I do not ever want to do a show in Australia. Um, um, go ahead. I have. We had a lot of Australians working at Boom Chicago, and they were just the kindest, nicest human beings. I'm like, that's great. This is great for friendship, but an audience full of you would be the death of me. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard to know you're doing well. Yeah, you got to really kind of squeeze it out of them. Yeah. 
Uh, that's kind of amazing that the normal kind of simple references don't work. That sounds like that is a good, uh, like it refines some comedy chops of just doing character work. Yes, it's great because you can't, well, the references don't work because even if they know what you're talking about, they don't necessarily feel the same way you do about right. what you're saying. So to be like, we all hate this thing. That's not a thing. They're like, we like this. The Kardashians exist. Because they are nice looking. That's fun. I like that. <laughs> you're like, oh, yeah, you're right. And I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you do have to. It, it, then it becomes fun to be like, do you like this French accent? And then the references are like, oh, you know how when you go to the beach, Germans always dig holes. <laughs> that shit kills <laughs> fucking if you wow. do a scene and you're at the beach you're like oh, look at that crazy German digging a hole people will be like yes, yes. <laughs> isn't that crazy that is a reference that will never get old That's in Holland awesome. you go there tomorrow and be like I'm on the beach oops I tripped in a hole Germans <laughs> Heinrich and they go yeah wow <laughs> I was uh, I was listening to uh, Mike Birbiglia and John Mulaney talk on a podcast last week, and they were talking about John Mulaney was talking about going to Florida and doing jokes about Florida, just to trash Florida as he's warming up the evening. Um, what is the Jacksonville, Florida equivalent for Amsterdam? Um, s South Holland is where they think like. People speak differently there. They, you know, in North Holland, where Amsterdam is, they have a ch in the way they speak. The G and a, a, a CH is pronounced with a ch. But down south, so it would be Schaefenenga, the city where there was a lot of war. And then in the south, they would say Schaefenenga. You know, and they'd have a soft, they call it a zacht J, a soft J, which they think is hilarious. And I'm like, okay, great. I can understand you spitting all over me, but the people from the South, I cannot understand one word of their Dutch. It sounds crazy to me. Local did shade. Up, wow. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Norm. Oh, no, no, no. That's, yeah. uh, did you end up doing other media work, like television commercials and talk shows? in? in Dude, Amsterdam? you're never going to believe this. So in Amsterdam, do you know how when you watch the uh, like a game show, reality show type of thing at the end is almost always this is by Endemol Productions. Right. Endemol is a Dutch company and there is this global, I think, test of game shows where every place with a game show comes and they all talk about it and they show it and blah, blah, blah. It's crazy. So like in Holland, they have, uh, they shoot a lot of pilots because they don't always go to Holland first. Sometimes they'll just go directly to America. So mm -hmm. because we're, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Boom Chicago. They come to Boom Chicago and they go, "You, I want you to host a show. <laughs> so I hosted two shows. <laughs> And this is what they were. Okay, so <laughs> do you remember on 30 Rock when they were doing that thing where they thought they had come up with a good um, a good game show and it was like a bunch of models with those um, briefcases, but yes, yeah. one briefcase was a bag of gold. <laughs> oh, the yes. model, you can always tell who had the gold. Yes. So we did exactly that. It was called, it was called Sound Imitators. Oh, God. <laughs> so they would go okay you will hear two sounds one of them is a person making the sound the other is the actual sound wow <laughs> <laughs> that is like a dude was, each way each time was clearer than the last it was like this is clearly not an actual cow it is a lady she pronounced the M in moo. <laughs> <laughs> the freaking best. And then, I mean, as you're doing it, it was exactly like that um, segment 
on 30 Rock. As you're doing it, you watch it fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing they did was um, they had... <laughs> I was like, I'm going to beat a beat box. Okay, so what is that? And I think what they meant was like a, a song being like scratched. Yeah. Dude, it was like, so what they had scratched was like a kind of like a country song. And then the song played for a little bit. It's a song. <laughs> and then they scratched a little bit. And then the guy was like, you got to book a <laughs> we were crying, doubled over laughing. It was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. And I was a part of it. The 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 thing that I would be looking for if in your shoes is there's somebody there who sees that it's going south, but whose job is to keep everyone going through the exercise until they're done, soldiering through. My sympathy would go to that person and my great respect for finishing the day, right? That was all of us. Because we all wanted to die. <laughs> oh my god. So the sound of a bird. Tweet, tweet, tweet. I'm a bird. Oh my god! I'm exaggerating, but only a teeny bit. Oh, that's great! Yeah, what a great thing to get to to witness on set. <laughs> so much money! So much money! <laughs> uh, those North Hollanders. Uh, yeah. Um, tell me about. Uh, do you have big future plans for your show post COVID, or are you just muscling through the weeks right now and? Um, we don't, we, um, you know, we don't, we, mm -hmm, we might be, uh, we, we, hope, <laughs> <laughs> we hope that we will be renewed. Got it. But who knows? <laughs> um, so, you know, who knows? So like, if we do. Copy then that. yes, you know, I don't know if we'll ever have an audience because this shit is cheap, it's fast, it's easy. You can make as many mistakes as you want. No one cares. Right. Like I was really excited about doing crowd work and like writing laughs and stuff, which I'm really good at because it was my full-time job for much more than a decade. Yeah. Uh, almost two. And then now that I don't have an audience, because you forget. There's no one there to be silent. Because everybody thinks about the laughs, but no one thinks about when you tell a joke and it bombs. There's none of that. Yeah. Wow. So, I, it, it, what, I, I, I don't think I tried to parse what was happening, but I did really notice specifically with Seth that the lack of the audience was really weird in the beginning and that he settled into well, this is how we do it without an audience. Like there was a, there was this weird time where it kept on, you could hear him like, ah, I want to laugh there. Well, he was like, I need you not to be laughing. Because those shows, and it's true, those shows where the crew is laughing, it feels weird. Because, especially to us, because... We know they've heard this before. Right. <laughs> so this is the, probably the third time you've heard it. So what are you laughing about? So then now he just has started dicking around completely. And now he feels comfortable when people laugh because they're laughing at him dicking around. Yeah. So now I'm like, oh, okay. This yeah, feels, no, you get a little bit of that feeling back. That, ta that, 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 that taking every one of his Trump impressions, just an extra two full steps. <laughs> so greedy such greedy behavior i love it what a little greedy bum we're all becoming greedy because there is also no one to tell you oh this bit was bad from the beginning you're three beats in right and you're like i'm still loving it and but you're loving because, it, it's so cheap. because it's so cheap then is networking mostly staying out of your hair um they don't really bother us. We have this like weekly call where they would really be concerned with, you know, what's coming up next week, blah, blah, blah. And now those meetings get moved and moved. They have stopped with the supervision quite quickly. We're still in the first <laughs> season. And 
I need supervised. But they seem to be cool. So we'll see. Man, that's awesome. I So I, one, I want to send you something for the wall of your office. And I'm going to find <gasps> I, something here and figure it out. And I'm going to send you something for some decoration. Yay! Because you know I'm not doing it. This <laughs> We 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 are. My wife is a brown thumb. She uh, she does great with plants that don't need any water, like succulents. But every time we bring a plant indoors, we slowly, sometimes excruciatingly slowly, kill it. And I've been thinking about getting a fake plant. I'm guessing the ficus behind you is a fake plant. He's fake. He's real. <laughs> <laughs> now, if he came a little bit closer, you'd be able to see how dead he is. <laughs> it seems like he's alive. He he's looks really good. No, oh, you know, that's the thing. The, the fake plants look really nice now. But I'll send you something other than a fake plant. Yeah, we got and then the second thing I wanted to say is, Amber, call, I, I, I'm, I'm ready to be your science, your, your science segment uh, dude. So when you want to add a science segment to your show, uh, I'm ready to do an experiment here. I'm not going to say I've never thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it sounds very exciting. That's just a shameless pitch. But when we first met, I texted you and said, you know, you can always call me for a science question. And you wrote back, that is so cute. You thought you needed to tell me that. (laughs) I know that's right. Look, if I come up with something, you're doing it. (laughs) Um, You'll also appreciate, I went and did uh, Sci-Fi Channel's The Great Debate as a TV show, the thing we did in New York. Mm -hmm. And um, I mentioned that you had taken the step of standing up and walking back and forth during your argument. And I think at least two people on the show decided to do that after I told them that. It's the way to do it, especially if what you're saying is bad. Absolutely. (laughs) You're gonna need some pageantry. (laughs) I I think we've all learned how far one can get saying terrible things with authority. (laughs) Oh. I'm sorry. It hurt my feelings. <laughs> the truth hurts my feelings. Oh, yuck. Well, but Amber, it is a valuable lesson, though, and it's about time we all start playing dirty. Indeed. I totes agree with that. <laughs> well, listen, my friend, it was lovely to catch up with you. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yay, you guys! Norman and Adam, thank you for having me. Uh, I can't wait until we can see each other again in person sometime in 2021. Here's hoping. You're going to come out here and we're going to act bad. I can't wait. Hey. Can't wait. Oh, be well and good luck with the show and good luck with both shows and all the shows. Thank you. I'll take your good luck and I'll put it in action. Excellent. (laughs) What a delight. Thank you so much, Amber. You guys, bye. I love you so bad. Um, are you in your house right now, or are you in the, at the uh, at the studio? I'm at the studio in my little office. They give me an office, dude. You have your own writing room. That's amazing. It's the best, and they literally put all kinds of shit in here. Because I, oh, can we cuss, Adam? Oh yeah, you can cuss. I'm so cussy. <laughs> um, but they put all kinds of stuff in here because I was like. They were like, you're doing a lot of interviews and um, there's nothing in your office. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I don't know, put some stuff in there. Who cares? <laughs> so look, look at what they did. Okay, first of all, they did this and like framed all the little bows I wear on the show. But <laughs> they um, gave me this. Oh, and this table really and shit. Nice. <laughs> oh, my God, sectional. And Adam, you'd know my couch. <laughs> Meanwhile, this couch is at work. That's the one. <laughs> oh, that's I mean, awesome. there's this floor here at Thirty Rock where you just can like they put all old SNL furniture, and when people get fired, they take their furniture and they put it there. So it's wow. just like this warehouse, and oh. you can just shop and get fucking trees and shit. So, nice. um, who do you have a list of who else has occupied that room over the over the decades? No, but we are at NBC Sports. No one is ever in here. <laughs> for years have been like, we need to take over NBC Sports because their main main place is in, I think, like Connecticut. So no one comes here. They don't have to. No one's here. Wow. Right. So now I think we might be taking over this oh. area. Oh, nice. 
that will raise morale for do people does everyone get an office or is there still like a pecking order so you can lord it over other writers people don't come in no, no. one comes in but me <laughs> let's talk about that okay <laughs> let's, uh, let's do an official start and yes. i think we can cut all this front part in um 